And I think I scare people because I'm like, well, you do realize when you're on this plane, you know, when you are on your wing seat Wednesday, you know, this is of course pre-COVID times when we actually flew on planes. And <laughs> yeah. you know, you're looking wing down seat at Wednesday. this, yeah, when you're looking down at this jet engine that it is operating at a higher temperature than the melting temperature of all the metallic components in that hot gas tap. How does it do that? Well, it's because of ceramics. Welcome to It's Material World, the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. With your hosts, Pranithi Padya and Tom Miller. In today's episode, ceramics, an ancient material class with a fiery future. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Kristen Brosnan, the technology director at Superior Technical Ceramics also a Georgia Tech alum, so go Jackets, and an expert in all things ceramics. So <laughs> welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you for having me. I'm always happy to talk to fellow rambling Rex. <laughs> <laughs> so Kristen, can you tell us a little bit more about your current role and why you're so passionate about the ceramics industry and material science in general? Sure. So as Tom mentioned, I'm the technology director at Superior Technical Ceramics, STC for short. We are a small ceramic manufacturing company, been around since 1898, and we're located just north of Burlington, Vermont. So basically what we do here is we design, manufacture technical ceramics from very specific material families like the aluminas, zirconia toughened aluminas, YTZP, steatites, molites, silicon nitrides, just to name a few. But we basically make ceramics for many diverse applications like high heat environments, corrosive environments, insulating environments, for mechanical wear and instrumentation components. And so as a technology director, I am leading a team of engineers, manufacturing engineers and material scientists and quality assurance to make sure that we are making ceramics that meet today and the future's technology needs in ceramics. So developing that portfolio of ceramics. And prior to STC, so I joined here in 2020, just a few months ago, I led an advanced materials team at General Electric Research, the flagship research center for the GE company. And in that role, we were developing high temperature materials for aerospace and defense applications. So that role was a lot of fun. I was at GE for over 13 years and worked on applications such as ceramics and gas turbines, ceramics and fuel cells, and coatings also for gas turbine environments, both land-based and aerospace turbines. I have been interested in materials since college. I can't say I knew what material science was when I entered college because I was not a materials major to start. I was a co-op and very bored at my co-op at the Department of Transportation. We were limited how many hours we could work. So I joined a Taekwondo class to take up time after my working hours. And my instructor was a material science professor. And he challenged me to take his intro to materials course. And I was like, what the heck is that? (laughs) And when I took the course, I was like, this is fascinating. This is exactly what I was looking for. It's the marriage of physics and chemistry and you know looking at how they interplay and the materials that are made from it and their properties and i was hooked i got an a in his class he did give me a c in the next class but i got an a in that class and he offered me a position working in his lab as a sophomore at georgia tech and that was my first job in research and that was the start of basically my career as a material scientist and i switched my major shortly thereafter So to start to get into talking about what ceramics are, you know, it's a very broad term. You know, we interact with ceramics every day and we, you know, don't honestly even think about it. So at a high level, what exactly are ceramics and how do they differ from the two other generally accepted major classes of materials being polymers and metals? And then also as you're walking through that characterization of ceramics, just something like alumina comes up, just break it down based on what that is in terms of, you know, like aluminum oxide as people know what aluminum is and pertaining that back to something that's more day-to-day applicable. Sure. So I knew you guys were going to ask this question. And (laughs) what's really funny to me about if you look at literally the textbook definition of a ceramic, so you go to David Kingery's Introduction to Ceramics, or you even go to Wikipedia, they define (laughs) ceramics by what they are not. 
Um, <laughs> and so from Kingery, um, he wrote, ceramics are solid articles that are inorganic and non-metallic. Okay, <laughs> so they're not metals, <laughs> and they're inorganic. Um, Wikipedia defines the ceramic as inorganic, non-metallic, often crystalline oxide, nitride, or carbide material. I just find that really funny that they're defined as what they aren't. I think actually David Richardson says it best. He is the author of The Magic of Ceramics. And he says they're fragile, they're sometimes strong and durable, they're sometimes brittle, some are like composites and more durable and tough. Some are conductive and many are insulating. Many withstand <laughs> high temperatures. <laughs> but if we talk about what they aren't, I mean, so metals are characterized by having non-localized electrons and polymers are characterized by being composed of carbon and hydrogen and they're not stable at high temperatures. So basically, if we wrap all that together, they're everything that doesn't fall into those two classes and isn't made of vegetables or animals. <laughs> so they're not plants and they're not animals. So it's a very broad term. And you mentioned alumina when you asked the question, how do you characterize? And, and really that's a polycrystalline oxide. And so many ceramics are metal oxides, however, not all. And as I mentioned, I work at a company where we sell nitrides and silicon nitride is a fabulous ceramic and it is not an oxide. So there's a whole class of ceramics that are also not oxides. I just, I found that hilarious. Oh yes, I- Every definition is like- <laughs> <laughs> No, we heard that definition in our first day of our ceramics class here. And I thought that I, was pretty funny. Cause that was I my remember, question. I remember to. that day of learning that. And still today, that is what students are taught in every <laughs> book and including Wikipedia. It is what they are not. Right. <laughs> and, you know, you can't say they're brittle because some are tough. You can't say that they're high temperature because some are not. You know, it's, it's funny. Just a follow-up question is, how does the microstructure and the composition of ceramics broadly enable these applications? Now, that's somewhat of a problematic question because, as you just said, it's an extremely broad class yeah. of materials, but I guess generally so, speaking. That's a very interesting question. And if we take one composition, so let's take aluminum oxide, which is one of my favorite ceramics. It is used in many applications from whitewares, which are plates, mugs, toilets, to engineering ceramics, which can be things like filters used for wastewater treatment with reticulated microstructures, spark plugs, you know, how do you start your car? Yeah. Uh, bearings, catalyst support, polishing of metals. So a material that isn't in an end product, but gets other products uh, to their end state. Cosmetics, sonar, transducers, toothpaste. There's aluminum oxide in toothpaste. Battery technology, semiconductor processing equipment uses very high purity alumina Just um, for like the <laughs> lids and the liners and the deposition equipment. And of course, jewelry. So ruby and sapphire are doped aluminum oxide um, in the single crystal form. So the difference is there between all of those end applications and the material that encompasses all of those applications is really the purity. So what are the dopants? You know, how much silica, how much chromia or and then the pore structure is it a porous is it completely dense the grain structure is it single crystal is it polycrystalline and then the phase is it alpha is it gamma and so one material aluminum oxide al203 can have so many different forms and there are books and and i remember my phd advisor saying that he once went to a talk where they said alumina is done. Well, it'll never be done. It's, still <laughs> done. it's not done. It's, it is still not done. It seems like with so many applications, like, yeah, it can't be done. It's, it's always going to be here just all around us. And so I was wondering, just like real quick, could you walk us through an example for, say, jewelry? What dopants are involved for it to be different types yeah, of... Yeah, I forgot I had this. So Leucalox, which is like transparent yes. aluminum, was developed by Cobalt. And a guy named Chuck Greskovich at GE helped make PCA tubes, polycrystalline alumina tubes at GE Research, basically by leaving this green part here in a furnace too long. <laughs> and over time, the grains grew and made this translucent alumina here. Oh, cool. Um, and these wow. were used in high pressure sodium vapor lamps. Now, mm -hmm. that technology is being replaced by things like LEDs, but this was the way that you could get a high number of lumens and light big areas like parking lots. 
But anyway, this is a very high purity, very, I would say, Equiax microstructure, aluminum oxide with high transmission in the visible. For jewelry, so this is polycrystalline. For jewelry, like a, let's take a ruby, for example, which has mm -hmm. a chromia impurity in it, which gives it its red color. And so this is a high purity alumina and a ruby is something that has a dopant in it. And the same with other colored alumina is like sapphire. Basically the crystal structure, so whether it's single crystal or it is polycrystalline, and then the dopants will give it its appearance. And then how dense is it? This is a probably 60% theoretical dense alumina. This is your 100% density. And so just a quick follow-up to that in terms of good material science term that you just threw out there. When you say equiax in terms of the microstructure, what do you mean by that specifically? So what I mean by that is that you don't have abnormally sized grains. And so you have a distribution of grain sizes that is normal and you don't have abnormal grain growth, which when that occurs, you get trapped porosity and that basically degrades your transmission properties. So you would not be able to obtain a translucent or transparent ceramic when you have abnormal grain growth because you would have a hard time getting to full density. Now that you mentioned that ceramics are basically not metals, not polymers, can we dive more into like the different categories of ceramics since they can have so many different properties? How do you know, how does glass differ from engineering ceramics or ceramics matrix composites? And how do their applications differ in each category? Well, I don't want to piss off the glass scientists out there, but um, <laughs> glass scientists would tell you that they're not ceramics at all because they're disordered oh. state. They're not crystalline. So they're non-crystalline. However, you can categorize ceramics by material type. And so you have your oxides, your non-oxides and composites. And in that way, you know, some people might throw glasses in there or by application, like traditional ceramics, like whitewares or advanced ceramics, like space shuttle tiles that are insulating and protect the gliders and the shuttles. I think a really good source to go to is the American Ceramic Society, which I'm a member of. And I actually lead or will be leading the basic science division in a few short days here. Congrats. Um, but that is the Worldwide Professional Association for Ceramists. But they basically break up their divisions by application. And so I think thinking of how ceramics are categorized is the best way is really looking at how the American Ceramic Society breaks up the different scientists and engineers and professionals and professors that identify as a member and they have different divisions. They have the art division. So we can't forget that a big class of ceramics is art. They have engineering ceramics. So coatings, structural ceramics for automotive, aerospace, armor, composites. You have your bio ceramics. So ceramics that are used inside the human body or used to help image the human body. You have your cements. So limes, plaster, or building materials. You have your electronics, capacitors, superconductors, varistors, electronic packaging, sensing, transducers, semiconductors, and then you have your structural clays, for example, bricks, pipes, tiles, and then refractory, which is another class where basically these are the ceramics that are used in the production of metal, like steel, aluminum, iron. Basically, they have to survive really hot and corrosive environments to make these metals. And so that's how the American Ceramic Society divides the different groups and I kind of like how they have made those different divisions of the different classes because that naturally separates them by material type as well. It also seems to like differentiate them by their applications too so that's it's really cool how those kind of mix together. Yeah and, and there are some mix like you'll find aluminas in the refractory as well as the engineering and the bio right I mean there are there are material mixes throughout but I think the end use application is a good way to look at the differentiation. And then within this realm of engineering ceramics, I mean, there's so many applications. So this other classification scheme will totally mesh between a lot of these things. But, you know, you had mentioned a lot of materials early on in this conversation that were either oxides or nitrides or carbides. And certainly that is not a exhaustive list of all the ceramics in the world because it's an incredibly broad field. But in terms of those specific categories, what's the benefit of having ceramic oxide or ceramic nitride versus a ceramic carbide? It really depends on the application. So for high temperature, one of the limiting properties of a ceramic oxide is creep. And so that is basically deformation at high temperature. And so that is why 
For example, in the gas turbine, GE announced and is now flying a silicon carbide, silicon carbide composite in the commercial gas turbines, the LEAF engines that power the 737 MAX. And the A320neo. And also the GE9X engine, which will be on the Boeing 777X. So there are non-oxide ceramics going into those environments because of their very high temperature capability and they are more creep resistant. However, because they are not oxides, they have to have protective coatings on them to prevent them from in these very hot environments with water vapor to prevent the recession or basically like losing silicon from the structure of those components. So, but in short, the non-oxides have a better structural application at very high temperatures. I didn't realize that that was a consideration that played into, uh, at least into the ceramic oxides family. As you mentioned, there are so many applications for this space. And a little background for me is that, you know, my mom's actually an artist, so she actually did a lot of work with ceramics at one point in her career. I, um, I bet you're happy I mentioned the art. <laughs> yes, I am. I do appreciate the, I do appreciate the plug. Um, and so it was funny when she was doing a lot of that work, I was starting to do more with material science. And so we would talk and kind of collaborate in terms of some of the work she was doing that was materials, but you know, more in sort of the aesthetic side, but also you, there is some material selection there in the processing of how they make sculptures and other things like that. But you know, there's a lot of, especially material science and you know, in any industry within this, there's a lot to get into about what the work is and what it involves. And it's not always super clear to people what material science work is. So in general, what is that number one thing that you have to explain to people about working in the ceramic industry when you talk to your family and friends about what your work is like day to day? I guess just in general, I think, you know, particularly in talking to my non-technical friends and family, there sometimes is a lack of understanding of the applications, right? Like, how does a jet engine work? And so I think I get asked more about the details about the applications and as an engineer, like, you know, I became an engineer because I was interested in how things work. Well, how does it get up to speed and how does thrust work? And, you know, and that always really interested me to understand that, well, you know, how does a car just start? And a spark plug is a big reason why we don't have to manually start a car and we have an ignition. And so I think what I have to explain to my friends and family is more about the application and you know, where it would be in an application. For example, that ceramics are key components in jet engines, you know, and now, you know, more than ever in the hot gas path of a jet engine. And I think to many people is very surprising. And, and I think I scare people because I'm like, well, you do realize when you're on this plane, you know, when you are on your wing seat Wednesday, you know, this is of course pre-COVID times when we actually flew on planes. And <laughs> yeah. you know, you're looking wing down seat at Wednesday. this yeah, when you're looking down at this jet engine that it is operating at a higher temperature than the melting temperature of all the metallic components in that hot gas path. How does it do that? Well it's because of ceramics. There are ceramic parts that are there and that are no longer there that enable that technology. And so I think, you know, when I have to explain like my job and, you know, what ceramics are, I I end up going to the application on why that's fascinating and, you know, the enabling feature that ceramics give those applications, like the jet engine. Yeah, I remember we were talking earlier about this same idea and you were saying that ceramics kind of inserts itself almost four steps back to where you see that end application. And that's so cool is you don't always see how they're in use, but they're so instrumental to yep. the end use and just, you know, in this case, the safety of the passenger. You just have to dive Absolutely. more into it. And that particular application in the hot gas pack, there's now at least three different types of ceramics in play that enable a very high efficiency gas turbine. So one of them I mentioned earlier is the silicon carbide, silicon carbide six sick composite. So that is newly introduced into the hot gas path and is in the LEAP engine, which is a commercially flown engine, and that is manufactured by GE. That component is in the stage one shrouds in the hot gas path. The other application of ceramics in a gas turbine engine is in the coating on some of the highest temperature components. So the combustion liners, the shrouds that are metallic, the blades and the nozzles. So 
how you direct the flow, and then the blades, of course, are what spin. And that basically puts a thermal gradient so you can bring the temperature down to the metal so you don't melt your metal. And then the third, which is, I think, one of the most exciting ways a ceramic impacts a jet engine is in the cooling passages that are in those shrouds, blades, and nozzles. And the way that those are made is a casting process that uses ceramics. So they're not there in the final jet engine, but they are critical to forming these complex cooling passages that enable very high efficient jet engines. And so that, I think they're one of the most fascinating ceramics because they're not even there in the end application, but absolutely instrumental into how jet engines are as efficient as they are today. We've really touched on, you know, the current applications, maybe even hinted at some of the future applications of these ceramics. But for just a moment, I kind of want to dive back into the history of ceramics. So yeah, we see sure. in early civilizations like Mesopotamia, China, and India, they all thrive from using ceramics, not just for practical containers, but like tiles, statues, and jewelry. So I wanted to ask you if you knew you know, how has mankind evolved from porcelains all the way to modern engineering ceramics? And if you want to explain engineering ceramics more, then go for it. Yeah. So I would even go further back because, okay. in, Let's do you it. know, ceramics have been important to humankind in how we basically went from a nomadic lifestyle into a lifestyle of being able to move around, right? Because we, humankind, learned how to make earthenware, basically molding and firing ceramic bodies around 30,000 BC. And so this fundamentally changed the ability for humans to travel. And it helped being able to make settlements so you could transport and store food. And then you know, around 8,000 BC, humans started using ceramics in the form of plasters for coating walls. And so it fundamentally changed how we were using it as a building material. And then around 3,500 BC, humans started using clay tablets that they dried in the sun to basically communicate and write on. And so ceramics basically helped enable transportation <laughs> and communication many thousands of years ago. And I just find that <laughs> wow. fascinating because it's also doing that today with our iPhones. Your it's up yeah, there. Smart yeah, and our smart <laughs> phones, too, right? yeah. And our jet engines. And so nothing has really changed. <laughs> These are engineering ceramics. Sure. Right <laughs> um, but then you mentioned porcelains. And I find that really interesting because, you know, that's a material that, first of all, porcelain originated in China and, and it was brought to Europe sometime in the late 1300s, but it was in China many hundreds of years BC, first developed. But it was not brought to Europe and Europeans did not know how to make porcelain until the early 1700s. They could not duplicate how the kaolin and feldspar and the microstructure and how to make that translucent material that was also thermal shock resistant as well. And, you know, porcelain is still used today. Porcelain ceramics are used as insulators and they are considered in engineering ceramic today. And so I would consider porcelain maybe the first engineering ceramic if you use the definition that it is from a, a very tight material tolerance source, perhaps a purified material or thinking about the composition of the material and how you process it. So they knew that you had to process it at a high temperature above 1400 degrees C or so and that it had to have a very certain chemistry, a certain amount of kaolin and other additives like feldspar to make this. And so to me, I think porcelain might have been the first engineering ceramic. And that's really what we do in engineering ceramics. It's about the composition and then how we process it and what at the end result is, what, what is the microstructure and what is the properties? And do they meet the application specific properties that we're looking for? Could you dive a little bit more into, I know you mentioned kaolin and feldspar. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I know those are the components, right, that go into the ceramic, yep. right? So those are basically the raw materials that you can mine. And so prior to having, like today, I were to design a ceramic or the ceramics that we make at SPC, we source from raw materials like aluminum oxide would be a raw material or yttria, Y203 or magnesia. But back then, you had to mine 
from naturally occurring clays and minerals that were in the earth. And there wasn't a refining process necessarily to bring out the other materials out of it, the aluminum oxide out of the kaolin, for example. And so that's really the difference there. And there are still ceramics made from clays and minerals that are mined, but many are refined. And that is where a lot of companies like STC, we use refined raw materials. Oh, that's fascinating. And it's interesting how we've gone through this transition from using these clay materials, which don't have this sort of purified chemical composition to now where, you know, we have yttria or yttrium based ceramic systems and aluminum based ceramic systems where we are being super scientific about what the composition looks like and how we do and- that. And I think one of the challenges that the Europeans had is that all kaolins are not the same. A mine yeah. of mm-hmm. kaolin from one area in the world is different from another part of the world or even within a region. And so you might have slightly different alumina silica ratios or other potassium oxide or sodium oxide differences in the chemical composition of those kaolins. That's super interesting. And I didn't think of porcelain as sort of being the first engineering ceramics of sort. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, I don't know that all ceramists would agree with me on that. <laughs> sure, I mean, sure. I think, I mean, just, it was very hard to duplicate and it had a specific microstructure property relationship that it was engineered. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. application. Some of it was art and some of it was very utilitarian for whiteware type applications. Not sure if that was like a, a bold take. I don't have the expertise for that, but we're, <laughs> we're all for material science hot takes on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, moving beyond porcelain and everything like that, can you give us an example of a modern engineering ceramic that has a significant impact on our world today? You had mentioned earlier this idea of casting cores, and uh, if you want to dig into that a little bit more. Sure. So casting cores are traditionally silicate based. And what's really interesting about this ceramic, and so as I mentioned earlier, they are used to form the cooling passages in metals. So in the metals that I'm talking about are nickel super alloys, which in a uh, hot gas pass are a uh, single crystal um, nickel super alloys for the hottest hot gas path turbine components. For example, a stage one turbine blade. To make the cooling passages in that stage one turbine blade, you would need a casting core that had a silicate type of composition. What's interesting about these casting cores is that Unlike other ceramics, which you think of as strong, you want strength, but not too strong. You want it to be, you want to be able to get it out at the end of the process of casting your metal. And to do that, you have to use an autoclave in a caustic environment and pressure, (laughs) and basically like pumping this ceramic out of the metal at the end of the day. So if it's a really strong ceramic, you won't get it out and then you won't have your air passage. If it's too weak, it won't survive the casting process. And the way the casting process works is first you would basically take your casting core and then you would wax over that core to form the shape of the metal. And so it's basically the lost wax process. And so you need to be able to form a ceramic shell that will define the outer surface of your metal blade with the core inside. And to do that, you have to use a wax process. And then once you have your wax on top of your core, you will shell. And that is also a ceramic. And that is usually a layered ceramic process. And that forms the outer shell that holds the metal in when it is liquid and poured into your mold. And the shell is also a mold. And so then after you shell, you want to put that into an autoclave and you will remove the wax. You will have fixturing to keep the ceramic core in place. So you can imagine it looks like a ceramic shell, some air gap that will eventually be metal in your ceramic core, which will eventually be air. And then you will bring that to a casting furnace where you will basically pour in your liquid metal and there will be a thermal gradient where you will slowly draw and create a single crystal metal out of that melt. You basically seed it in the direction you have a seed and you have a grain orienter to basically make sure you have the right orientation of your grain. But at the end of the day, you'll have a single crystal metal and you will have your core inside your metal. And then you need to remove your casting core once everything cools and you remove your metal from the furnace. You remove the shell, you remove the core by putting it into an autoclave, and then you will use an EDM or a similar tool to basically drive holes through the metal to the cooling channels. And then that is how you basically connect the cooling channels to being able to film cool the surface of your metal during operation. All right, so Editor Tom here. Just a quick clarification before we get right back to the show. So EDM, 
stands for electrical discharge machining, which is a way of cutting away at a piece of material to get a desired shape using a set of sparks. And sparks are technically known as an electrical discharge. Now, without further interruption, back to the show. It is a complicated process and it is not cheap. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of the day, the ceramic that forms the, the core inside of that, that process has a complicated pattern. They are made through a couple of different processes today. One process is basically high pressure injection molding, a very precisely machined metal die with a ceramic. Another process is directly printing the ceramic using 3D printing. And so that mm -hmm. is a way that is being explored on how to make those casting cores. And you could go to different 3D printing websites like Lithos or Admatech and see that they have casting core examples that are made by 3D printing. And I just think that's fascinating because how we form ceramics is also changing. And one of the barriers of changing a cooling pattern in the turbine industry is how long it takes to machine those very precisely machined dies for making the injection molding of the ceramic. And so this is a dynamic market right now and things are changing fast and it's something to keep an eye on. I think that's another great example of sort of what we had discussed earlier where, you know, a lot of these applications are, you know, aside from white wares and all that is very far back in the supply chain. And it's not something that, you know, something we take for granted in modern life, but is super important um, nonetheless. And so to dig into that a little bit more, how is the microstructure of these casting core materials, how is this microstructure engineered to meet this sort of Goldilocks zone sort of requirement in terms of these properties that you mentioned? Because it sounds hard enough to make a ceramic that's, you know, super, yeah. you know, super strong. It sounds hard to make a ceramic that's super soft for various applications, but it sounds a lot more difficult to make something that's just in the middle and just. <laughs> it, it really is. And one thing to remember is that it's touching a molten metal. It doesn't help. And, <laughs> and not all metals are created equal. And so depending on what component you're casting, it will have a different composition. Um, it will, nickel super alloys have a number of different dopants in them and they can be more reactive than one composition could be more reactive than another composition. And what you don't want to happen is have a reaction with the core material. And yes. so it would be wonderful to have just an alumina core, aluminum oxide with no silica, because then you would minimize the reaction between the silica and mm -hmm. the metal. However, the more alumina you have in the core, the stronger it is. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't want it to be too strong. And so that's where the Goldilocks comes in, right? It's got to be just right. Um, and so there is a lot of development in mullite cores, which is an aluminosilicate, um, to basically like be a less reactive core material. So there's actually a lot of science that goes into making these cores in terms of the microstructure and the composition because of the reactivity uh, with the metal. So it's touching the metal during the casting process and then also, depending on the application, whether it's a land-based turbine or if it's a jet engine, it may also be touching the ceramic. The metal might be touching the ceramic and in close contact during the heat treatment. And so after you bring it out of the furnace, you may remove the core either before or after a heat treatment to anneal the metal. And so time at temperature, if you're taking thermodynamics um, and kinetics, you'll know that if you're going to have a reaction, if you increase the temperature, you're basically enabling that reaction to happen even faster at higher temperature. And so there's a lot of science behind carefully controlling the composition and the microstructure of that core to minimize the reactivity with the metal. Any defects in the surface will cause turbulation in, and you can't go in and machine those inner cooling channels. There's no line of sight to seeing them. In fact, as you go to more complicated cooling shapes, inspecting them, which used to be done with the boroscope, becomes very hard and you have to use x-ray CT imaging to actually see the surfaces and to make sure that you have a good casting because they are so complicated today that a visual inspection is just not possible anymore. So then what is that Goldilocks range exactly? Like, is it difficult to stay consistently within that? And how do these processing variations and all of these things that you were just talking about, how do they influence the ability to get within that range? Yeah, so the core manufacturers all have their own recipes. Some of them are highly proprietary, but I will say that it's about the composition, but then also how you fire it and how you drive crystal formation 
which is a high temperature form of silica. And so that is basically defined by your processing conditions. And so every core manufacturer will have their low fire and their high fire process defined to carefully control composition and the microstructure. And one of the outputs or one of the things that they measure is high temperature flexural strength or modulus of rupture. And so those are the targets that they would um, try to hit. Which is to say that material scientists and ceramists are interested in studying the strength of these materials in bending conditions. And now, some transition music. Talking more about structure property relationships, but maybe going to another application entirely, I was wondering, you know, what structure property relationships allow ceramics to be used in biomedical applications such as dental or bone implants, since you mentioned the the concept of bioceramics earlier in this episode? Yeah, so I think there are a few, certainly strength, if you are going to have a medical implant that is a ceramic. I also think that there is a aspect that isn't structural, but it is a property of ceramics and it is how it looks on an image. So ceramics would show up looking like bone on a CT or an X-ray, which I think is important to people and you wouldn't set off metal detectors. And then I would say another property that is important for biomedical applications is osteogenic. Does it promote growth? of mm-hmm. bone and does it promote bonding with surrounding tissue and then of course anti-pathogenic you do not want bacteria and you don't want the growth of the wrong kind on your implant right. and then microstructure certainly is of importance particularly if it's a porous implant to promote growth within the structure itself typically found in ceramics like the hydroxy appetites which are used in the biomedical space And so do you see these ceramic material selections for implants being inspired by nature and by naturally occurring material systems? I definitely think so. I think, you know, the hydroxy appetites certainly were developed with that in mind for dental implants, which by the way, like ceramics for dental is very recent. I think the first zirconias were approved only in 2011. So that's very recent. Those were really because of the aesthetics of having something that looked like bone in in your mouth (laughs) Um, and the color matched, right? But there's other properties that make it really fabulous, which is some people have real allergies to metals and also they are less prone to corrosion. But yeah, I, I certainly think like the color matching and being more like a bone in microstructure and in how it visibly looks certainly has an impact. So most things that we put in the human body are stainless steel, like screws and pins. Certainly people have heard of titanium implants. One that is, I think, very interesting, there's a couple companies making them and making them by 3D printing is silicon nitride implants. Mm. And they have really interesting properties because you can 3D print them. They're very strong. One company called Syntex, S-I-N-T-X, that is making basically like lumbar, like spinal implants for folks. And they're FDA approved. And I just find it really fascinating because again, it won't show up in a CT or an x-ray. They have shown in different studies that they're better in terms of less rejection from the human body than like a peak or titanium with the silicon nitride implant. And I just, I think that's really fascinating. I think it's something that we all need to keep our eye on because ceramics in the human body are very recent, but it's certainly a growing field. And there are also, I would say, aspects of ceramic processing that are being used to 3D print and make capillary sections for how different tissue is being made today. And I just find that fascinating. You said that this is a recent development with bioceramics. So I was wondering, can we compare it to the use of metals in the human body and the use of polymers in the human body? Like why use ceramics for these types of biomedical applications outside of what you mentioned about maybe the color or the fact that they want to get yeah. through a metal detector? <laughs> I mean, there are certainly aspects or there are more resistant to microbes like bacteria. Again, the osteogenic parts of being able to promote bone growth and not having a rejection from the human body. And then, so when you get an x-ray or CT, if you have a metal implant, anything behind that metal would be blocked by that metal. And so it really inhibits the ability to see in that region. And so if you do have a ceramic implant that looks like bone in the CT, it allows more efficient imaging in that region in the future if the patient were to have issues. 
So what about like comparing it to maybe a rigid crosslinked polymer that may still have those mechanical properties, you know, would still pass that test on an x-ray. Can you compare those two? Well, certainly the benefit there is that ceramics are generally stronger than, and I assume you mean, you mean like the peak materials. And then you can more easily clean the ceramic prior to going into the human body. And that is really important because you don't want, for example, I have a ACL repair in my knee, but I chose to use part of my own body to do that because if you use a cadaver or foreign material, there's a chance of rejection. And certainly like you can't put peak in a high temperature oven and kill off anything without deforming the structure. You mm-hmm. can do that with silicon nitride and other ceramics. So moving away from implants and prosthetics and those sorts of things, how else have ceramics had an impact on the medical industry? I feel like it would be a miss to leave it at the ceramics go- that go inside the human body, but mm-hmm. ceramics are also enabling technologies on how we look at the human body and diagnose. And so I think if you've ever gotten a CT and laid there in that tube and wondered how that worked, it's enabled by a very highly technical ceramic called a scintillator that basically converts x-rays into visible light and then through a lot of signal processing gets you an image. And that technology has advanced a lot in the last even 20 years to basically take the noise out, to be able to get the image sharpness and to be able to image things like the human heart pumping blood where, you know, when it first came out, static CT, you know, was the only really mode of CT imaging. Also, ceramics are used in the ultrasound transducer. So I'm a mom, I have have four kids. I was pregnant with twins at one point and I was getting a lot of ultrasound scans that was enabled and being able to see my two babies, baby A and baby B was enabled by ceramics in those transducers to basically turn a sound wave into an electrical signal that could be then made into an image. That's a ceramic at the heart of that technology. So the ceramic at the heart of that technology is something called a piezoelectric. And that was actually first discovered by Pierre Curie, the husband of of Marie Curie, who many people have heard of. And piezoelectricity basically is converting a mechanical energy into an electrical energy or vice versa. And so the piezoelectric is the ceramic at the heart of the transducer and basically helps to make that imaging possible by taking a sound wave and converting it into a ah. into a picture or an electrical signal that is then converted into a picture for you. So you're bouncing sound waves off of the baby. You know, moving outside of the realm of biomedical applications and more broadly speaking, are there applications where you see ceramics will replace metals in the next five to 10 years And if so, what changes would need to happen either on the ceramic side or on the metal side? And in terms of these ceramics mechanical behavior and manufacturing costs, when would that become viable for those replacements to occur in these various areas? It's happening now with structural components. So I mentioned the three uses in the gas turbine that are making gas turbines more efficient because they can operate at higher temperature. And so the component use of a ceramic in the turbine, the, the one component that is being used in the commercial turbines is the six sick silicon carbide, silicon carbide composite material. And the reason it can be used is that it is higher temperature capable and it has a metal like toughness. So it's not brittle like a ceramic that you would think of. You can actually kind of bend it if you had a small piece of this material. And I have done that um, before. So as applications get more extreme or you want to get more energy efficiency, you're going to get to hotter temperatures for like an engine application. Ceramics are a prime candidate to start replacing these metallic components. We can only cool a metal so much and we're already (laughs) operating them above their melting temperatures. But the advances in increasing the melt temperatures for metals, we're getting a few degrees F per decade. But making that jump to ceramics, we're getting a few hundred degrees F by just going to another material system. And so now we know how to make it so that it is more tough and it is metal-like. So right now the components that are being replaced, ceramics are non-moving parts. So like the shrouds or the nozzles or the combustion liners. Um, But we are trending towards an all ceramic hot gas path. And that 
is a, I think, really cool technology and something to keep an eye on. And that's enabled by a composite material. So we hadn't really talked about them before, but it really is a ceramic fiber in a ceramic matrix. And it gives it a toughness that, you know, isn't there for a monolithic ceramic, which has basically just no fibers. It's not a composite. Most of the ceramics we talked about prior our monolithic ceramics. Um, ceramic composites have those fibers, and depending on how you lay the fibers and how you basically engineer that microstructure, you can get the strength and the toughness in the regions that you need it for a specific component, like a turbine shroud. That's so as you go to hotter applications, and like think about it, we're building spacecraft and sending people to the International Space Station, and, we, and there are plans to send people to the moon and maybe send the first woman to the moon <laughs> ever. Um, and how are we gonna do that? It's gonna be ceramics. The applications are certainly getting hotter, higher speed. Uh, you know, folks have heard about hypersonics in the news recently. You know, so moving at these high speeds requires the use of materials that can withstand these high temperatures. And that's all ceramics. You know, they're certainly one of the enabling technologies. So from your vantage point, what do you think the future of ceramics is? And what will these future ceramics applications look like? I think, again, the applications are getting extreme and how they started and helping us, you know, transport people and communicate is exactly the future of ceramics as well. <laughs> I mean, they are very critical in our smartphones, how we're going to get from point A to point B, whether it is on this earth or beyond this earth. And it is also key to our sustainability on this earth. I mentioned earlier that one of the applications is wastewater treatment for filtration. And so the future is the past um, and the present, but they're only going to get more technical and, and uh, we need more people to study and to make them better so that we can all live on this planet together. We're off of it. <laughs> or off of it, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Nonetheless, ceramics all has a place in enabling that future. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're hot. <laughs> no, they are. are hot. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we've really covered a lot in this conversation. I think we've covered, what, 50,000 years of human history or so? <laughs> um, or, or it, a, and it a may, good... It's more or less, give or take a couple thousand years, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we covered a lot and we covered a lot of time and a lot of space. And so I'd like for you to bottom line it for us. And, and, you know, what are three things that our listeners should take away from this discussion on innovations in ceramic technologies? So first, this is a highly technical field. We need all the help uh, that we can get. So I hope that some of you are inspired to look into it as a, as a future for you. Second, you know, ceramics are driving many diverse applications impacting every aspect of our lives, how we get places, how we live, and all the devices that we use that make our lives simpler and easier. And finally, it's really the, the key to our future technologies as well, our defense, how we travel, and how we live. So I hope that some of you are inspired to look into it as a possible career choice. Thank you so much, Kristen, for, for coming yeah. on to the show. We really appreciate it and you really lay it out just all the applications in just various industries ceramics is clearly a versatile material class and i think we really got that from this episode oh so the one thing i probably should have mentioned earlier but i didn't don't tell my boss this but one of the reasons we become ceramists is because we like to break things now nobody <laughs> wants their ceramics to break but that is a good reason to become a ceramist because to understand their strength you have to break them and that's kind of a lot of fun <laughs> i love that <laughs> clip that <laughs> yeah and seeing this expensive ceramic that you've you know spent decades Oops. engineering and getting well, right you have to anyway. break it to understand its strength yeah right. absolutely. absolutely you have to break it so just to wrap it up kristen if our listeners want to reach out to you. Where's the best place that they can find you? Uh, sure. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at, or on Twitter at Kristen Brosnan, or just feel free to email me kbrosnan at ceramics.net. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. We will look forward to releasing our next episode in two weeks. But until then, if you want to hear from us, we are on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. 
search for us as It's a Material Worlds Podcast. Links to our social media sites will also be in the show notes. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. We're just two college students looking to get started with a podcast, and we want to grow the show with our community's input. You can send us feedback through messaging on any of our social media sites. Feel free to also provide feedback by messaging us directly on LinkedIn, either to Punithu Padia or Thomas Miller. But until then, take care and stay healthy.